So for those <clears throat> who may be coming here for the first time, I'm Eve Ekman, holding the space for the well of being. And in this um, time together, we get just this amazing opportunity to reflect on the teachings, directly experience the teachings, and discuss the teachings. And this is this is the, the framework. It's interesting. I currently um, have the opportunity to, to do some curriculum planning and education, and I know there's other educators in the room, but this practice is so fundamental, right? We, we have to have a chance to kind of learn about, analyze, understand, then really embody it and feel it, and then kind of bend it, shape it. No problem. Come on in. Shape it and like really consider it. If we just sat here, kind of talked about the concepts, it will be interesting. It's pretty interesting. I mean, it's extremely repetitive Buddhist practice. If you haven't noticed, same stuff over and over. And that would be, you know, interesting. They're good theories and philosophies, but it wouldn't give us something so core to these practices, which is the ability to apply them in our heart and our mind so that we can apply them in the world, right? So we try them out here in our little laboratory of uh, meditation practice and a sit. And then we can also come up with and formulate really good questions. Like, why is the practice like this? What does the practice mean? Or how could I actually take it into the world? Um, and it's really beautiful. Um, those of us who've been here for the last 50 some chapters and no worries if you haven't, we're going through the historical life of the Buddha and really seeing how he discovered and kind of created these, these teachings so beautifully just through his life experience. So first when he's searching and seeking, then as he himself discovers what he calls the way, and then how does he share this with others? And sometimes he shares it with them in a very um, kind of deliberate and specific way related to something happening in the world. And sometimes he delivers uh, what are called suttas or these teachings that are just, you know, kind of coming out of him all at once. And we're like along for the ride as he is formulating new ways of sharing the very same teachings over and over. The teachings at their core are all intended to remind us that everything is always changing and everything is connected. But it's so hard to remember that, like so hard. And so we have to have all these different ways of accessing it and also these methods and tools for that direct experience to see for ourselves. And where we are in the book currently, We've um, found ourselves on what is arguably one of the most important suttas, which is the Satipatthana Sutta. And we started that last week. And this is the sutta that is most commonly associated with mindfulness, with developing this facility, this capacity, this skill to apply our mind closely. And as we apply our mind closely, two really important things are happening. We're developing steady concentration, which in this day and age is maybe one of the most valuable assets we have, right? Our capacity to sustain our attention. That's where deep work happens, you know, when we're focusing and trying to get something um, done, whatever kind of work we're doing. That sustained and stable attention allows us to, to learn new things and hold them, not just kind of multitasking. I might have shared here, but I, I heard this really disturbing um, statistic the other day, and I, I haven't referenced it, so I can't say that I know where it comes from in the research. It might be more like a, a self-report survey, but that people are spending no more than 17 to 30 seconds on any screen at any given time. So there you are on your computer doing one thing, doing the other thing doing the better thing, you know, just this fractured attention. And not only is it probably not great for what you're working on, it doesn't really give us a sense of being grounded, being present, being embodied. And what we know from a lot of the contemporary research on mindfulness and then the historical evidence of these thousands of years of practice is that sustained attention feels really good is beneficial for our well-being. 
And this is something we'll practice together, see for ourselves. So it gives us this ability to sustain and cultivate our attention. It also gives us, and this is so important because if mindfulness was kind of just developing attention, it might get a little, make it a little tight, a little dry. Another huge part of our mindfulness practice is the insight and the clear understanding. So our ability not only to pay attention, but to pay attention to the body, to pay attention to the breath, the mind and our feelings, other aspects of our mind and mental formations that arise. And when we pay attention to them closely, we start to get into those core understandings. Everything is changing. Everything is connected. Without those core understandings, the world is very confusing. Such a kind way of saying um, that we are totally delusional and caught up in craving and aversion, right? We're confused. It's, uh, I like that. Um, Mace and I got to be at just this unbelievably beautiful teaching this last weekend. It was a, a woman named Kandrala, Tibetan woman, who um, she really is holding a space of a teacher that feels ancient, feels like really could be like the suttas in this book. And she really was teaching from a place of such grounded presence and that kindness of saying, how do we help with your confusion? And not because she has an agenda for us to not be confused, but because we're suffering in our confusion, right? When we mistake something to be lasting forever that is temporary, it's, it's painful, right? And we don't understand it and we think it's our fault or we blame someone else. But if we see and understand its true nature as always changing, less pain. And so we start, like we can think about this with, of course, relationships and jobs, our physical health, everything changing, sometimes ending or reshaping. But we can start by noticing that even the way our next breath might come in might be subtly different might shift or change than the last breath. We notice that some of our thoughts, which maybe seem like the totality of what's going on, are only one thing that's also constantly changing and reshaping. So this practice of mindfulness is just, it's so beautiful. And the Satipatthana Sutta is, it's a very methodical way to cultivate mindfulness. Um, there are many, 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 many <laughs> discourses and translations on this important text. Um, I've been kind of immersing myself in them the last couple of weeks because I wanted us to kind of take a moment to pause and, and give attention to the sutta. In the book, it's, it's only about three pages and I'll reread that for us. But I think it's nice for us to slow down and yeah, pay a bit more attention to this sutta and kind of make it alive. Uh, one of the other things that was so beautiful this last weekend of practice was hearing people chant these suttas. So for hundreds of years after the Buddha died, there was no written catalog of his words. It was a always repeated version of these suttas that is sung. But singing maybe gives it a little more credit than it's due. Not singing like a nice song. Singing as in droning words, right? <laughs> so like, I recognize I am, da, da, you know, it's like very low and slow. But you get a sense of these words. And it's, it's just an interesting, um, for me, it was really interesting to remember that part of truly instantiating these practices on the heart. Like reading it is one thing but like giving the words life through the, the resonant tone in your voice is beautiful, <clears throat> but I'm not going to lead us in a chant tonight. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I think that could and should and would be something interesting other folks can do, but just to say there's so many ways to let these learnings come in for us. So what I'd like to do <clears throat> is read just a little bit and then we'll, go into a practice together, and then we will discuss a bit more. Um, I brought one other source tonight of the Atipatana Sutta, which I think is just so beautifully, just so beautifully written. Um, and I'd like to start a little writing on, a little reflection on this writing altogether. 
<clears throat> so this is from um, a teacher who did a translation and an introduction to these practices in the 1930s. Uh, his name is Soma Thera. He's coming from Burma. And he just has this kind of beautiful opening discussion of these practices. He says, mindfulness is a process, an event and an arising and a passing away momentarily like any other mental property. Although it is a basic power, a shelter and a refuge of the mind, the role it plays in the drama of transition from ignorance to knowledge differs considerably according to the other properties of mind with which it works. For, in, for instance, in association with right understanding and its group which comprises wisdom, intense knowledge, discrimination, research, consideration, discernment, um, and clear comprehension, it is rational. And when it's combined with right concentration, and it cognates, such as mental stead steadfastness and serenity, it's intuitive. But the intuitive or rational role does not preclude mindfulness from communicating its regulative impulse of moderation to the mind at all times. It is the property which makes for proper proportion in the response of the mind to mental objects. So this idea really that Mindfulness is like it's a naturally occurring property in the mind, not something that we have to create or develop over time. It's already there. We can find ourselves in mindfulness. <clears throat> I feel like riding, riding my bike, I can really have a sense of mindfulness. And the difference I notice for me is whether I'm reaching out towards what I'm seeing, right, or just receiving what I'm seeing and noticing its impact on my body, on my mind, on my heart. So if I pass as I did, I passed by a young woman who was dressed up maybe for some sort of party, but you know, it's San Francisco. So she might have just been dressed up. And at first there was just this sense impression, pink, red, glitter, kind of polka dots. And then there was that second part in which I was leaning out. I wonder where she's going. And I wonder who's she gonna meet? And I'd fallen out of my mindfulness. I, I, was, I was doing like a little bit more. I was kind of contracting in my mind and starting to have these ideas, maybe even getting into judgment or comparison. But just that simple meeting of experience and being present enough, not like, oh, my God, I got a flat. Am I going to be late for class? I think I'm going to just make it. That would be not being present in the moment and completely missing out on this amazing outfit that I saw. Yeah. Right. But then I can also go too far and analyze or get into it. Um, do, do, do. Mindfulness as memory is indicated by the terms anusati, calling to mind, hatisati, remembrance, dharanata, bearing in mind, saranata, recollection. It is the connection of these processes of mindfulness. It's compared, it's compared to being the treasurer of a king who reminds the king of the royal possessions in detail daily, at night, and in the morning. So this idea that mindfulness, you know, the contemporary secular translation is paying attention without judgment in the present moment. But the more traditional translation is bearing in mind and remembering. And what are we remembering? We're remembering impermanence, interdependence. We're remembering to kind of have this presence in the moment so that we can investigate those qualities more deeply. And I kind of like, I like this analogy of um, being the attendant, uh, the treasurer of the king. So you're kind of like having in detail daily in the night, in the morning, um, like the mindfulness is helping us keep in mind and remember what is valuable and what's important to us. So it's our, our little treasurer. Last week, we started with the mindfulness of breath and the body. And in that practice, we really attended to or paid attention to the breath, really noticing the breath as it is traveling in and out and knowing we are breathing, not just breathing. 
And we looked at and paid attention to the length of the breath. Is the breath long? Is the breath short? And then the calming of the breath. So we notice it and know it. We notice its length. And then we invite it to actually help us calm. But the next form of mindfulness in these four foundations is really drawing mindfulness to the body. Such a simple practice, but in this full Satipatthana Sutta, the way we bring mindfulness to the body is actually recognizing that the body is made up of many different elements and also recognizing that the body is kind of like this big, I can't remember what Kondrala called it, sack of bones. Sack of oh. Bag of bones, bag, flesh, and pus. Bag of bones and flesh and pus. That's not, doesn't feel very enjoyable, but meditating on the reality of the kind of materiality of the body helps us from getting over identified with the body, concentrating too much on the body. And what um, was talked about a lot this weekend and, and throughout this book of self cherishing so hard for us to not prioritize ourselves, to not become self-involved, to not become self-concerned. And it's not, not just that that is bad. It creates suffering, right? Our self-absorption, it prevents us from being available and aware to what's happening around us, which might be really interesting. And it makes us feel kind of like stuck inside this small sphere of concern. And we recognize that this body, you know, is just a beautiful and um, truly a miracle, but also like in decay from the moment we're born. That remembrance can have the quality of helping us feel <clears throat> liberated from the self-cherishing. It's, it's a bit of a tough one. So tonight I'm going to suggest that we, in our practice, we start with the four remembrances. So these are um, helping us to keep in mind the, the just fundamental truths. And with the four remembrances practice, I, I will share one of the remembrances and then invite you to just sit with it. Let it kind of steep within you. So you hear this, which you know to be true, that it's precious to have a human body, that everything, including our body and everyone we love, we will lose, that every action we take, every thought, speech, behavior has a consequence, and that seeking our happiness in the outside world often leads to more suffering. Those are the four remembrances, but to really let it settle in the body and to practice a kind of mindful awareness and attention to those. Um, so that was, I usually like a lengthy preamble. That was kind of next level. Uh, we are now <laughs> going to practice. If you'd like to stand and stretch before you practice, if you'd like to find uh, a position on the floor, lying down, We're going to take a couple moments here to really establish an inner and outer posture of practice. At the outer level, inviting ourselves to find a comfortable position that balances a sense of uprightness, vividness as well as ease and softness. So we can find that lovely uprightness through the spine. Mm. 
almost imagining that through attending to the spine, <clears throat> we can lengthen up feeling as though there were a string at the very crown of our head pulling upwards. And then softening, relaxing, melting, and feeling that first through the muscles in the face, softening the forehead and through the eyes. Softening the cheekbones and the jaw. Softening the heart and the belly. And part of our posture at the outer level is inviting a quality of stillness. Of course, if we are in pain, we can slightly shift and move. But considering if there's a position that we can hold and really maintain a stability. And inviting a stillness to the inner posture of the mind and the heart. And a stillness of the choice to be right here. And for the length of this practice, there's nothing else to do, nowhere else to be. And as we continue to settle in the body, the speech and the mind. Inviting the quality of inner silence, of course, outer silence without speaking, but the inner silence of settling the ongoing narrative of our inner thoughts and ideas. And we can do so by bringing our mindful attention to the breath. Breathing in, knowing we are breathing in. Breathing out, knowing we are breathing out. We can play around a little bit here, noticing the difference between a kind of grasping or tight attention on the breath and the more balanced, vivid, but relaxed attention of mindfulness on the breath. So for the next breath or two, see if you can really tighten the focus on the breath. 
just like noticing every aspect of it. Trying to anticipate what will happen next. Almost as though you're examining the breath under the microscope of the mind. And then shift and just gently release some of the tightness of that focus and feel the breath, feel the breath from within the body and feel the breath as a gift, something you are receiving, not leaning out towards. Feel the body breathing you. It can be hard to maintain this looser type of concentration and mindfulness to the breath. We may become diffuse, spaced out, carried away. Just continue trying to oscillate between a, a vividness of attention to the breath while maintaining an ease, that receiving posture of the breath. And with our mindfulness of breathing, we may just gently notice that some of the breaths are shorter, maybe shallower. Some of the breaths are longer, maybe deeper. Without any forcing, allowing the breath to be natural, simply observe. In the moment you notice you've been carried away in thought. You've already achieved awareness, attention, developing the mindfulness. So simply relax and return to this noticing of the breath over and over and over.
This practice can feel so challenging. We might feel as though we are not succeeding. Our mind is running around like a wild stallion. Or we feel exhausted, lethargic, tired. No problem. Just keep returning for a bit longer here. Every time we return, cultivating a closer and closer understanding of developing mindfulness of breathing. Maybe we notice that we can pay attention for two breaths in a row or three or four. Any amount starts developing this capacity of noticing our mind. Gently shifting now our attention to the cultivation of bodhicitta, an awakened heart. This simple and essential practice reminds us that the root and the source of our motivation to practice is to open our heart and minds in service of limitless beings. This may sound intimidating or far-fetched, but it's in this expansion that we strengthen the core of our compassion, breaking down the self-limiting boundaries of just caring for ourselves and those we already know. Bodhicitta is a concept, but it's also a feeling. So consider these words and this possibility. Waking up the heart for the sake of all beings. Expending and extending our heart to limitless beings. This doesn't mean we have to know what to do. Doesn't mean we are immediately acting and reacting. It is a stance and a way in which we are approaching the world. Sometimes for our bodhicitta, it can be helpful to bring to mind a group of people or persons in the world whose suffering really moves us. So 
just imagining this group of people so in need of compassion and support, feeling that flicker at the heart and letting that flicker become a flame in the heart, breathing into it. <laughs> Feeling this vantage point, this setting of our compass with bodhicitta. It infuses all the rest of our practice. All of our practice is in service to this possibility of opening our heart with compassion to limitless beings. Whether our practice is good or hard, the motivation is the most important. A couple more breaths, seeing if you can feel the awakening of bodhicitta in the body. With this body having been infused with bodhicitta, returning to the breath for a couple more moments, breathing in and knowing we are breathing in, and breathing out, knowing we are breathing out. And shifting our attention and mindfulness to the whole body. Becoming aware of the field of tactile sensations throughout the entire body. Maybe there are areas which feel warmer or cooler. Areas where there is a sense of energy and movement tingling, heaviness. Again, without reaching out and becoming tight, applying this kind and curious mindfulness to all the sensations in the body. Mm 
as we apply this mindfulness to the body, we may notice that the sensations in the body are shifting and changing. In this way, we can develop some insight into the ever-changing nature of sensations, energies, different processes throughout the inner viscera, of the body, throughout our bones, muscles, vessels, only some of which we can actually sense and feel. Shifting now to the four remembrances while keeping close attention to the body. I will say the phrase of the remembrances twice. And just notice the shifts and changes in the body. Maybe thoughts appear, but not energizing them. Allowing ourselves to be mindfully present in the body. The first of these remembrances is recognizing the preciousness of this human life. Recognizing the preciousness of this human life. Noticing and riding the waves of shifting feelings and sensations that may happen in the body with this contemplation. The second remembrance, which is that everything is impermanent. Everyone we love, including ourselves, will of course meet their end. Everything and everyone is impermanent. 
everyone, including ourselves, will meet their end. Continuing to attend to the body and refreshing our interest and attention and awareness to the shifts and changes in the body. The third remembrance, which is that everything we do, we say, we think, has an impact and consequence for good and bad. Everything we do, say, and think has an impact and consequence for good and for bad. The last of these remembrances, seeking our enjoyment and satisfaction only in the outside world will lead us to a non-stop cycle of aversion and craving. Seeking our enjoyment and satisfaction only in the outside world will keep us in a nonstop cycle of aversion and craving. Part of this practice is learning to be mindfully present with these core truths, understandings about the world, not to become overwhelmed with despair or aversion, but to be able to be present and aware, caring, and create some spaciousness around these experiences that are inevitably true. Finding the <clears throat> quality of equanimity within our mindfulness.
releasing these remembrances and returning to that heart of bodhicitta, recognizing that every being faces impermanence, change, consequences of karma, getting caught up in samsara, that every being wants to be free. Every being wants to enjoy happiness. And the path to that happiness and freedom comes through the simple practices, maintaining awareness of our breath and body. Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment. Breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. Thank you for your practice. Not the easiest practice. So thank you for your integrity practice, being with. Thoughts, questions, reflections on the practice? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to share anything else? <laughs> so relaxing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> Anyone at home or otherwise in the virtual realms? Hi, Hugh. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I was going to say that I have the opportunity to join you and I think many of you in the space and during the pandemic. Even two thousand early two thousand. Yeah. This is my first time with hmm. so really, really nice to be here in the presence of the wall. Yay. 
for, and for folks at home, uh, we have someone here who is, was with us online in the pandemic, and this is their first time here in person. And that it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, it's really funny. I remember the first time coming in, I had so much resistance. I was like, my cats can't come. Like, why would I do that? Um, but it really is such a different experience um yeah indeed other folks questions on that practice like what it, what was it like to let those land in the body i think i just have a question about the order of yeah like for me if we flipped it so that the last one was the fresh of human life mm. Because after going through like everything's impermanent, everyone's gonna die. Me focusing on like being cooler than I am is gonna make me happier, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then being like, oh, and then this life is precious. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I don't make the rules. Uh, so Mace is asking about the order of these, and would it be? better in some ways to have the preciousness of human life at the end. And I bet, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen it in a different order, but I wouldn't be surprised just because there's so much variation. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it is, and it's interesting. I mean, I felt a lot of feeling waves personally with, especially the first two more than the last two, like really riding big feeling waves. Um, but the karma and samsara is kind of like, yeah, yeah, I oh, know. Here we are. It's like a little, a little different. Um, yeah. And they are, you know, I, I do find it so kind, but yet so, um, so cutting to keep those in mind. But it's, it's not news, right? There shouldn't be news. And yet we try so hard to avoid it. I do feel like the samsara and karma, which I'll just say one or two more lines on this, this idea that whether or not we feel like we're really kind of doing good or bad in the world, like our energy has a huge momentum and we are constantly creating. You know, if you want to use the um, kind of analogy of the, of the brain, like neural pathways, right? We could just think of it as streams down the mountain. We're like forging these different ways of thinking and being and seeing all the time in many more ways than we're conscious of, you know, I also think about just the, you know, the human body and how we end up like kind of compensating for an ache here by moving another part of our body there. And then all of a sudden, before we realize it, we're kind of like hiked up on one side and we haven't really even paid attention, but that was like happening over months and then years of us just, you know, that just momentum of karma is, is, is really useful and um and then also this you know this idea of just how unsatisfactory samsara is really i i find that really easy to see and feel in my daily life but i still seek you know pleasure from the outside world and try to avoid harm and that's okay. Like we are, you know, there's this human creature body, uh, with its needs and it has very important needs, but if that is where we're spending the majority of our time, right. I think a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the cultivation of true sustaining happiness. What are the causes of true sustaining happiness? And a lot of it is the cultivation of this inner world, finding ways to make our mind feel more at ease through concentration and our heart feel more peaceful with compassion. But like proportionally, most of us spend like 10% of our time on that endeavor and like 90% kind of pursuing these other forms of happiness and well-being. And just to be able to like see that and know that is it's humbling. Um, yeah. Do I see a question forming? Okay. Any other questions or reflections on that practice? Oh, somebody has a baby. Sorry, that is incredibly cute. Hi. Aw. 
very good teacher right there for natural breathing. Yeah. Babies, they breathe in such a beautiful way, not encumbered at all. But yeah. <laughs> any other, anyone else? Is this the first time anyone did four remembrances? Yeah. How, how's that? Good. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, okay. I'll do it by. Thank you. I don't want to hear this. Okay. I, I, uh, I, after the second one, everything is going to die. Or, is that right? Mm -hmm. Or everything's impermanent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I sort of started to go there. I was a little like, well, is there any point to anything? And then, and then I was like, well, you know, it's going to be good. You know, it feels good to be loving and not be, you know, right. anticipating shit and mm -hmm. crap. Um, that feels better and it's nice. And then, you know, this, then when you did the karma thing, I was like, yeah, cause like, you know, that's the good place and you'll be cultivating more of, you know, what is nice in the world. So, yeah. Yeah. I, it, I was kind of like, I forgot the what was coming. So I was like, oh, yay, I'm, I'm going there. <laughs> okay. So there is a method to the madness, maybe. Yeah. Just repeat them. Yeah. Preciousness of human life, which again, there's so many different um, elaborations, but that we have this precious human life is an unbelievably rare opportunity. Right. So in, especially in the, in the Buddhist thinking that we might've had hundreds of thousands of lives as ants and gnats and, you know, um, yeah, microorganisms. And wow, we won the lottery. We have a human life this time. And the human life is the only one in which awakening is possible. But I just think human life is precious. That's just so clear, right? God, it's so, I mean, it, it's magical. It's just unbelievable. And then the second is, and like, we're all going to die. Uh, and then the third, karma, right? That what we do has an impact, good and bad, every single thing. And then the fourth is samsara and the, the difficulty and unsatisfactoriness of living only and essentially from a desire to avoid what's hard and, a, and a seeking of what feels good. So, yeah, very simple, but helpful. Well, actually, I think I do. Okay, great. So um, in terms of like everything that we do has a consequence, good or bad, um it's the first time i've heard that one mm. and so how does one not take that to a place of self-centeredness of like mm. what am i doing right now is it good or bad yes so that the, the question is um how do we not get kind of maybe neurotically preoccupied with our karma right and have it be something we're focusing on and you know the interesting thing is um everything is intention and motivation. So if we are focusing like on that bodhicitta throughout all our activities, it's likely going to guide us towards good or bad is a very kind of, yeah, simplistic way of saying it like wholesome and unwholesome. So it's not about achievement. It's not like, Oh, I did good. I'm like, good, or, oh, I'm bad. It's more, are we acting out of that motivation, which is altruistic and not self-centered? So it ideally is not. And, you know, it's like, I think about this a lot in the context of emotion, right? Um, I think I've, I've said this before, if our emotions showed up on our body, like bruises, we would all pay a lot more attention to our thoughts and our feelings. Right. If we had every time we were anxious and worried about something, if we like it showed up as a bruise and it was visible to other people, we'd be like, whoa, oh, man, like, wow, like I'm really God, this hurts. You know, it hurts and it's visibly like hurtful. Um, but most of us are kind of engaged in low level anxious rumination a lot of the time. And we're like, it's fine. It's just in my head. But there is an impact physiologically there's an impact on our body thinking about anxiety our body is anxious there's not like a big difference and just kind of reminds me of that idea like we're like with karma well i'm not killing anybody you know I'm like I'm, I'm a pretty good person we're not taking into account like what are the ways that we're energizing judgment and like blame 
Right. And the one that, wow, so hard is like idle chatter, you know, like, are we talking smack about other people? Cause it's fun and it makes us feel connected to other people. Right. Are we engaging in these other, like more subtly harmful activities? So I think the intention is not to make us feel like, oh man, I'm on, yeah, I'm on the karma evaluation, constant evaluation, um, plan or train or mm, that's preoccupying me, but really getting clear that all, not only our actions, but our thoughts and our words, like we can really bring a clear motivation to all of that. And again, not only is it like good as in wholesome and helps others, like it's good. Like we lay our head down at the end of the night, we feel like more peace. I really, truly, you know, I'm so sold on the idea that peace of mind is just an incomparably wonderful feeling. And like, what can we do? And like, what's in the way? And like, I don't know about you all, but like after I engage in some like meaningful, not meaningful, idle chatter, like, oh yeah, this person did that. And that person did that. And it kind of feels good in the moment, you know, like, and then after you're like, oh, that wasn't very nice. Like it doesn't feel good. Like in the moment it did like flaming hot Cheetos. Right. But, uh, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel, there's a consequence. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not good for our system. Is that okay? Yeah, good. I don't want us to get all more puritanical on our um on our ideas of of striving and doing in the dharma okay friends online thoughts questions objections okay I think my eyesight's getting worse okay great so I'm going to read again, um, just these really simple, the simple way that Thich Nhat Hanh has kind of distilled the Satipatthana Sutta. And um, if you are interested, the Satipatthana Sutta, like truly, there are so many versions of PDFs online. If you just want to read the full Satipatthana Sutta, it is... Um, not a very compelling read. I'm going to be honest. It's, it's informative. It's helpful. Um, and, uh, it goes into like a lot of detail. I really like his distillation here. So I'm going to read it through. Um, and this week we're really still focused on like breath and body next week. We'll get into feelings and mind and thought formations, but I'm just going to read it here for us. Um, in the spring of this year, the Buddha delivered the Satipatthana Sutta, the sutra on the four establishments of mindfulness to a gathering of more than 300 bhikkhus, which was the capital in the capital of Kuru. This was a sutra fundamental for the practice of meditation. The Buddha referred to it as the path, which could help every person attain peace of body and mind, overcome all sorrows and lamentations, destroy suffering and grief, and attain highest understanding of total emancipation. Um, mm -hmm. First, the practitioner observes their body, their breath, the four bodily postures of walking, standing, lying, and sitting. Bodily actions, such as going forward and backwards, looking, putting on robes, eating, drinking, using the toilet, spinky, speaking in washing robes. The parts of the body, such as hair and teeth and sinews and bones and internal organs and marrow and intestines and saliva and sweat and the elements which compose the body, such as water and air and heat and the stages of the body's decay from the time it dies to when it, when the bones turn to dust. And so, you know, it's really this first part is to kind of really just have a mindfulness of attending to just what we call the not gross as in disgusting, but gross as in not subtle form of the body, right? Paying attention to our body in different postures, as we're walking, as we're sitting, like, can we maintain mindfulness of the body all the time, all the time as we are looking and going and peeing and eating? Like, is there any time when we need to be separate from, from the body in terms of our awareness? Technically, no, 
but but I don't know. I think it would be really interesting for us to do a an experiment for the next 24 hours, just maybe every hour or so. How much was I in my body this last hour? How much was I aware when I was typing or speaking or eating or what would be your guess? What would be your hypothesis? 20%? On a good day. Okay. May says 10. Anybody else? What do you think? I'm going to give myself 50. We'll see. I, I can try it. I do think, you know, it, it is effortful at first, but starting to become attentive and aware to our body becomes very like reflexive over time, you know, because we notice, you know, when we're sitting here in practice and that large motorcycle goes by, it's not just, oh, there's a motorcycle. We feel it in the body. And as we start to like attend over time, like the body becomes interesting. It's, it's our, it's our primary sense organ, right? Everything that we are experiencing, we're experiencing through the body. And so it is, it is possible. Um, and then also this, you know, so not just developing that kind of um, instrument of the body that we can sense it, but recognizing the body as like, yeah, this, this bag of sinew, right? Just, wow, like it's, it's so precious to me, but really it's just, it's the same matter that is of everything else. And also recognizing, and this one, this is what the, the four remembrances I think are helpful for, recognizing that the body will decay. So a very common practice, some of you may know, is, is called the charnel ground practice. And in India, it's quite common to help with this mindfulness of the body and its decay to go sit in what are often open graveyards and watching the bodies decay, right? And really having, you know, this sense that we can recognize just the impermanence of every single body that we are like that body. And it sounds really harsh, but again, the goal here is to help us get freer from the self-cherishing. Self-cherishing is so tricky. I don't love that term. It has like a antiquated feel, but because I, I love the Dharma and it comes up so much in the Dharma, I think I have an affection for it, but it's really just being self-absorbed right? Completely concerned with ourself. And when we do that, we inadvertently start to think we're special. We are the star of our own movie, right? It's all about us. What's happening to us? And part of recognizing, you know, that we're just this sinew and bone, just like everyone else. And just like that body that is decaying, we also will decay. Such a powerful reflection right? Like what will this world be like when we are gone and everyone we know is gone? It'll be the same, right? Without us, but it's so hard. We don't imagine that very often. Um, <clears throat> while observing the body, the practitioner is aware of all details concerning the body. For example, while breathing in, the practitioner knows they're breathing in, breathing out. They know they're breathing out, breathing in, making the whole body calm and at peace. The practitioner knows they're breathing in, making the whole body calm and at peace, walking. No, the practitioner knows they're walking, sitting. They know they're sitting. Performing movements such as putting on robes or drinking water. The practitioner knows they're putting on robes and drinking water. The contemplation of the body is realized not only during the moments of sitting meditation, but throughout the entire day, including the moments one is begging and eating and washing one's bowl. In the contemplation of feelings, the practitioner contemplates feelings as they arise, develop and fade. Feelings which are pleasant, unpleasant and neutral. Feelings can have as their source, either the body or the mind. When they feel pain from a toothache, the practitioner is aware they feel pain from a toothache. When one is happy because they have received praise, they are aware that they're happy because they've received praise. The practitioner looks deeply in order to calm and quiet every feeling. 
in order to clearly see the sources which give rise to feelings. The contemplation of feelings does not take place only during the moments of sitting meditation. It's practiced throughout the day. So it's almost like our, our homework for the week ahead, contemplation of feelings, just such a rich practice, Vedana practice. And curious from folks, I know many people in this room have practiced Vedana practice. Like, what have you learned from observing the pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral? Yes. Um, one thing that's been interesting is I'll have a perception that a feeling is never going to go away. Usually it's the negative, kind of cloudy, foggy, like not great mood feeling. But if I really pay attention, it does shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would not be good if I cried. Yeah. I yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and for folks at home, um, describing really paying attention to a feeling, especially a, a difficult feeling, and realizing that it's temporary and that it goes away. And are you saying too, that actually paying attention to it may help it shift and change or just noticing that it changes is helpful? Um, probably both. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's extremely hard to remember. Like, I, yeah, you know, when we are in experiencing anxiety or anger or insecurity, like whatever, it really does feel not only unpleasant, but permanent. Yeah. And that insight into recognizing its ever-changing nature. I mean, that is freedom. And that's true. Also, it can help us with empathy. Like this person who's being angry, this person who's being, you know, what we think of unreasonably anxious or upset. That's they are not just the upset, angry person, right? That's something that's temporary and shifting for them, too. Yeah. What else with um, unpleasant, pleasant, and neutral? Have people noticed or any questions about feeling tone? Yeah. Um, I really enjoy practicing with physical pain as a, uh, I've, I've done it a lot as a dentist. I have to go to the dentist a lot. Um, and uh, with practice, if you can just notice the sensation of it instead of labeling it, yeah, um, it it just changes. It's just sensation. It's a very intense sensation sometimes, but it's just sensation. And like the feelings, it goes away. <laughs> so I find that a really really cool practice. Yeah, yeah. I it's it's truly like. Yeah, such an amazing insight. And, you know, we have very good evidence that social pain and physical pain exist in the same neural pathways, right? So they are kind of creating this um, experience that's so unpleasant. And it really is, it's such a beautiful way for us to understand dependent um, origination. There's the sensation then there's our opinion about the sensation, right? And we see that these experiences, they aren't just bad, right? Or unpleasant. That's, I hate that. Um, it's, such a, it's such an interesting way to like untangle that which we are just like wrapped up in. You know, I almost think of us kind of the more it's like being in the spider's web and like we're a little fly. And the more we thrash around, just the stickier it gets. And just release and um we'd still be stuck in the spider's web but maybe not quite so tight um but yeah it is it's such a it's such a good one and it is really cool you know the simple aspect of labeling <clears throat> we know that labeling our emotions for example gives us space around our emotions and labeling these simple states of like unpleasant pleasant it actually makes it easier to be with um, because we're not just kind of letting ourselves be, you know, pushed side to side by the feelings. We're using our capacity. We're using awareness, naming it. This is unpleasant. It'll change. That's like a bonus round. We could just do unpleasant, but it'll change, you know, because we can get a little tricky 
when we use something with an agenda, like, oh, I'm going to label this unpleasant because I hope it goes away. <laughs> There's a, a patience needed with our practice and, you know, to really not get too tight on the outcome because sometimes the outcome takes a little while. And I'm curious, Noam, like how long did that practice take until you really felt you could start to utilize it? Is it <clears throat> quick or did it take time? Just being able to the, be, the yeah. Practicing, as soon as I, I thought I should just try this, it was amazing. Wow. Very first time. Yeah. And then it led to a reduction in anxiety going to do this as well. So, the, the yeah. In the dance chair is actually very, very small. Wow. And it just passes like that. Yeah. You just let it be sensation and not. not That's beautiful. It. I mean, that is right. Like that is, that's why that is the cessation of suffering, right? Like this huge oversell of this will help you destroy suffering and grief and attain highest understanding. But it's kind of true. Like these simple practices of bringing mindfulness to our experience can help us really. And like you said, I think it's like that pre-contraction, like that anticipatory anxiety of like, oh, it's going to be terrible is a lot of our suffering. Um, so that's a way to, um, again, I, I just, I just love the simplicity of focusing our mind and concentrating so that we're able to notice what's happening, but also that insight, like, yeah, like, what is this? And like, how long? It's so simple. I mean, I don't know about you all. I have heard these teachings a lot and they still kind of blow me away. Um, it's really beautiful. And to know why we're doing them, right? That it's it's about our own freedom, but our own freedom means we're available for all beings, right? That that piece is so important. Um, and there's no other way. So there's that too. Yeah. It might be like a really beginning level question. It's certainly like, like, I don't get why this is so hard. <laughs> it's sort of like, no, you need a tangerine. No, you need a tangerine. Those are the days when I start to eat a tangerine. And I just had this compulsion to read the newspaper while I'm eating tangerine. Yeah. Oh, or something like that. Yeah. Wait, why? Is this really unpleasant? Is this really aversive? Or, so I have to occupy my mind. Yeah. But really a struggle to mm. get like, Dental pain, I can say, okay, well, I understand that's really unpleasant, so I understand why I'm going to strike this. But these other things that are just like your breathing, your being an engineer, your whatever, like I keep struggling with this thing. I'm like, I don't get why this is so hard. Yeah, that's not a beginner question. I think we can all relate. And so the question, if folks um, at home didn't hear, is why is this so hard? Why is it hard to sustain and maintain our attention and awareness, especially to mundane tasks, right? Like what is the compulsion to like do something else at the same time? So I, yeah, I'm gonna do that annoying teacher thing. What, what do you think? <laughs> like, what's your sense? Like, what is, what's the, like, what is there? Like, is there a, a charge of some sort? Is there a thought of like, can you tell like, what's in the way or what might be the obstacle? I think I'm just sort of working on it. I mean, I'll try to like, I will sort of discipline myself by like, no, you're reading the damn tangerine. You're not, not going to read it. So it feels like it's very tight. And very, and yeah. Not at all in the spirit of it's just, it's like, yeah. Okay. So I keep, um, you know, I keep wondering is there some thing about impermanence that's arising when I'm doing this? Mm. You know, that's not good news. That's sort of like, you get like, oh my God, I'm being reminded that yeah. this is impermanent. I don't like that. Or, yeah. I'm sort of conjecturing. That yeah. I don't have a, a, like, I haven't found a thing of like, oh, this is what. It's because I'm worried I'm going to die if I yeah. can't drink too much. If I enjoy it too much, it'll be, it'll be too painful. No, it's, no, yeah. There's no longer can't drink in season. Or, <laughs> or, but I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Really, I mean, yeah, I'm just struggling with it. I feel like I'm making some behavioral progress. Yeah. Like, you know, down. Yeah. Not watching TV while I'm doing something else. Yeah. But it still feels like I've a little question about the kind of get why this is so 
when you when he lays out for you and I mean, yeah. so obvious you're reading or it's just you're reading. Yeah. It's like why do I need that other thing? Yeah. Yeah. And, and for folks at home, there's um, a good deal of like investigation and consideration of like, what is this? Is this me not wanting to meet the impermanence of the tangerine or of something else? And, um, you know, I, I do think it's such a great area for that first person investigation. And, um, you know, in my own relationship with things like social media and even podcasts like I, f I consider podcasts fairly wholesome but when I took a month off them I was like uh, you know like what's gonna fill that space right and just that compulsion to fill space for me it's 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 existential loneliness right and it's not like there can actually be someone around but it's more that like like, what am I here for? What is this all about? What does it mean? And we are like able to pretty much distract ourselves in all waking hours. That is easy to do in the conditioning of our society. And those moments of pause, a lot of stuff can surface just as energy. And we may not amorph, we not be able to identify it. It's like this amorphous, like, oh, oh like, you know, and I, in my own experience, and I really invite you and everyone here is what happens after that, like, maybe queasy, not so comfortable feeling of just being with ourselves, <clears throat> something expansive. Like, it's just this kind of like surface level agitation. And it can be worth looking at it and being like, is this lonely? Is this sad? Is this despair? I mean, yeah, if you're not upset about this world, you're not paying attention, right? There's so many things to be upset about. Our own lives, our own history, our own family, like there's there's plenty of material. And so instead of needing to maybe investigate and understand it to every single particle, can we just be with, oh, there's like agi there's unpleasant agitation. Okay. And getting really curious about how it feels in the body. You know, and so instead of the distraction, maybe getting really curious about the, the whole push and pull of it, but not making it bad or wrong to engage in distraction because it's OK. Right. As long as we can like and I love what you're doing, which is noticing, like, why am I doing this? You know, we I'm all for us taking care of ourselves in so in such a variety of ways. Um, and that can include healthy distraction and reading the paper or right, you know, podcasting. But it's it is important to give ourselves some time, not only in practice, but throughout our daily life to just be with what's happening. Right. And not turning on the radio, not, you know, just because there is that I just feel like there's that surface level agitation so yeah no thanks for putting words to that I think very common experience so let's um let's reconnect to that beautiful bodhicitta energy and really remembering our purpose for being here and connecting to that motivation that brought us each year tonight And feeling that spark of it, maybe even feeling that flame of, of desire that we could be of service in this world, which so deeply needs our service, so deeply needs us to awaken in heart and mind. And then doing a simple offering symbolically of our time here together and considering that any goodness, any enrichment, any benefit of our time here together could radiate out and be in service for all beings making their way to finding the true causes of happiness. All beings finding the causes and being able to alleviate the causes of suffering. And that all beings could find peace and ease. That all beings could be free.
Thank you all so much. It is such a joy to be here together. So precious. And um, a reminder to folks here and online, your support really helps. We're a volunteer run center. We need financial support. We also need volunteers. If you're interested in hanging out and helping out, that would be great. Um, we have a lot of volunteers in the room. You can, you can talk to anyone, raise your hand in the room who's volunteer. Hey, amazing humans. And online, I think we have Jimmy, Diane, Hugh. Okay. So we got, anyone wants to know more about that? 